societies do not come out of the blue. They become, they evolve, they grow, and they change. And this process sometimes happens organically, and other times it happens by force through subtle violence or outright open violent processes. And these processes don't, violence doesn't necessarily mean that people get killed and beaten. Sometimes it's cultural erasure. Sometimes it's forcing new ways on people because we believe that our ways are much higher and better than those of the people who are currently existing within that society. Uganda, like any society, has gone through different phases of evolution from pre-colonial period to the formation of the nation state as we know it today and to the country that we have, the borders that we have today. These processes, some were organ organ organically happened, others were instituted by a couple of men seated in Berlin led by Otto von Bismarck. And that has and that process has influenced the way we look at development today, but also look at the smaller communities within which we exist, mostly determined by ethnic um, identity across the country. And because these processes have happened in ways that we are unable to clearly articulate or fully understand over the years, it has also had an impact on the way we design and implement projects to improve the lives of the citizens of Uganda. One of the critical schools of study or fields of study that has informed the way we should be thinking about development is the study of cultural anthropology. And today to discuss with us cult cultural anthropology and how that influences the way development happens or can influence the way development happen happens is a cultural anthropologist, the managing director of CPAR Uganda and the founder of Alinga Farms, uh, Miss Nora Owaraga. Nora, you are welcome to the women's talk show today on Civic Space TV. Thank you. Yes. So Nora, to start off the conversation, um, I used a very big term somewhere in my introduction where I talked about cultural anthropology. Could you just help us have an understanding of what cultural anthropology is as a field of study or as a practice? Um, it's my honor to be recognized and identified as a cultural anthropologist. That's how I identify myself as a cultural anthropologist. I do not even begin to say that I am an expert cultural anthropologist, but I am a student of cultural anthropology. It interests me. And uh, from your broad, fantastic introduction, you have touched on many of the things that make up cultural anthropology, except you are using politically correct terminology. Uh, instead of talking about uh, ethnocide, you talk about erasure. <laughs> instead of talking about <laughs> cultural imperialism, you talk about one culture. Thing. You know, so you, you basically have it. So culture uh, is where we sort of take off. A cultural anthropologist studies culture. And there are different ways of studying culture. You can study culture of one unique group and observe them, or you can study culture of different groups and compare them. And from your introduction, for the case of Uganda, we need to study several different cultural types in order for us to understand what is going on in Uganda now and to appreciate how then we can sort of propose a change. Culture, when, when somebody talks about culture, culture has different dimensions. But when you're talking about cultural anthropology, you're looking at the kind of culture which is about ideas, it is about belief systems, it's about the way we think, it is about uh, social behavior, uh, it's, it's about uh, social, social structure, how are we organized, physically, but also how are we organized in our thoughts. And so when you talk about culture in relation to cultural anthropology, that is what we are talking about. And I like a definition of culture, which is most suitable for cultural anthropology, which talks about culture as the knowledge uh, people use to live their lives. And so for us who study culture, we are looking to find out what knowledge are people using to live their lives? That is what we are looking for. And then when we establish what is that knowledge that people are using to live their lives, we then want to establish the way that people are actually living their lives, okay? So someone, for example, uh, can say, my name is Maria and I am a Christian. 
And so we go and look at the body of knowledge of Christianity and say, what does the body of knowledge of Christianity say? And she says she's Christian. Is she living according to the Christian principles or not? Mm -hmm. If she's not living exactly according to the Christian principles as they are written, say, in an old text, like maybe the Bible, you say, well, mm -hmm. she's actually living without the specific examples in the Bible, but she is within the general central logic. And so very mm -hmm. often we are not looking at the, uh, the example we are looking at the central logic. What is the central idea that informs the way that a person lives? So for example, if someone is living in a grass-touched heart, uh, we don't look at the grass-touched heart. We look at, do they believe that if they do this, if they do this, if they do this, something will happen in the same way as someone who lives in a, a Mabati house believes the same. Mm -hmm. So it's the central logic. What is the central idea that informs the way people live? What is the central idea that informs the way people dress? And those ideas leading on to our conversation now inform mm -hmm. the way someone will then contribute, say, in word and therefore in action and also therefore in policy. And you cannot divorce the thinking of people from the policy that they will develop. And I will use an example of our, what was it called? The Anti-Pornography something, something, something? Act, yes. The Anti-Pornography Act and the committee that followed it. Uh -huh. The thinking that informed that is very specific mm -hmm. about how a woman should dress. Now, you go backwards and say, mm -hmm, what informed this? Was it Christian teachings or what? And then you begin to unfold backwards. And then you say, well, if they say, it is not okay to wear short dresses. And you see pictures of our mothers in hot pants. Mm -hmm. Then you say, how did we move from that time when our mothers yes. were okay in hot pants and to mm -hmm. this time when they are saying that we must put on dresses up to our ankles. And so yes. we begin to unravel it there. And, and that is why cultural anthropology is extremely important to be present in every single department, every single department, every single ministry, every single organization that, that pretends to make policy for people. Yes, every thank you, Nora. I want to just like stop your thought there mm -hmm. and, 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 and bring you back to something. I'm, I'm glad that you pointed out how important it is to center cultural anthropology in every area of thinking because so there's um within the feminist um ideological circles there is a statement that is used a lot the personal is political that the way i think the way i interact in private spaces will definitely um, inform the way I, I behave in public spaces, but also my personal life is a center of political interactions, right? You talked about um, you talked about clothing and how the way I choose to dress becomes a matter of legislation in public space. Before you know it, I think there was also a, a, a discussion at some point about parenting, that how government was now going to start a policy around how people should actually teach their children certain things and stuff like that. Now, when we are discussing central um, ideas, like what the, the idea that informs our word and action, what, in your opinion, would you consider the, um, the maybe different uh, issues or different events or different occasions that have, that have contributed to forming the, the school of thought that informs development in Uganda today? Okay, uh, very interesting because then you're talking about individual agency and how that individual agency may be constrained by groupthink. Now, who gets to participate in the group thing is the one that determines what is considered the norm and acceptable behavior. And mm -hmm. for Uganda, the one that considers the norm and the normal behavior overall is whose culture or whose knowledge system is considered education. In Uganda, when you talk about education, they automatically mm -hmm. think about the global Western formal education system. And in our case, it's actually not exactly the same education system like a child in Europe 
will be getting or a child in the global west will be getting it's a bastardized version a colonial version of the english system and so within that english system we are given priority that that knowledge uh, is priority and all our knowledge systems of our first nations of the iteso are subservient mm -hmm. to that knowledge and when that knowledge says that your belief systems in the Teso culture are witchcraft, uh, then everybody says that that is correct. And nobody mm -hmm. begins to say that if in the global Western system, they also have symbols for worship, why are my symbols for worship, the ones that mm -hmm. are demonized and the symbols of worship on the other side are not demonized. And so if a child goes through, a Ugandan child goes through an education system and they do not have a solid uh, parenting or a solid background that grounds them in their own culture, as I believe my parents did a good job of doing for me. And when I say parents here, I'm looking at the extended family structure of the Iteso culture. I feel absolutely comfortable in my culture at the same time as I feel comfortable in my global westernized knowledge systems. And to get that comfort, where you appreciate both and take the good from both and recognize the bad in each of them, I think is the highest level of empowerment. And so if we have accepted that English is our official language, because culture is also about language. If we have mm -hmm. accepted that English is our official language of Uganda, that means that the terminology that is used in policies for us is English words. And those English words, how do they then translate to our day to day? And very often I have had a head on collision with people who author uh, the development plans for Uganda or people who author policy statements for Uganda. I very often find that there are many statements in there, which if you put mm -hmm. them through an English audit, they are meaningless in English but they are being implemented as policy. So if you don't even understand the language in which the policy that is governing you is written, how then are you part of that policy? And, and, and so if we cannot domesticate even just basic policy to our own languages and use them from that reference point or from the central logic of our own languages. You mentioned COVID in your opening. Now, mm. for example, lockdowns have seemingly worked in the global West in controlling the pandemic. In Uganda, we have followed to say, let us also lock down the country. But mm -hmm. in order to lock down, the global Western governments, Europe, uh, United States of America, they are locking down, I am very sorry about that, they are locking down their countries because they know that if they lock down, there will be less congestion at home. But if you look at the homes of most of the urbanites in Uganda, does that mm. logic still remain the same? Because no, it for, doesn't. For some children, the schools are safer than going back to a slum, which is congested. So those are the nuances that cultural anthropology uh, focuses on cultural anthropology focuses on this is the way of life and mm -hmm. this is how it works now a lockdown in europe makes sense but for some in uganda a lockdown doesn't really make sense if the child is going to be removed from a nice spacious boarding school to be brought back to a congested slum where they are living maybe in one or two rooms with their parents mm -hmm. with very little ventilation and living close together, then the lockdown doesn't make sense. Um, when the lockdown says, okay, it is now lockdown and we are going to facilitate people who have been working already. And uh, at, at least I'm, I'm remembering what the minister was saying, the prime minister was saying that if you have not been receiving a certain amount of money on mobile phones, uh, you cannot be considered as a beneficiary of the relief fund. And I'm thinking, mm. how many of those people you see selling bananas in, uh, in, in, in the urban areas 
uh, have mobile phones on which they actually have the luxury of having the cash sit on mobile money as opposed to have it as their capital. Because you will find most likely that that woman, the one that the minister, the former minister for trade was seen trying to leave her day carrying mm. bananas in, in, in the city, her capital is not there to sit. Today you sell mm. the bananas, you go back and buy another bunch of bananas, and then you come back again tomorrow. And the difference, the, your income is for you to feed your family on that day. So if on that day you have not sold the bananas, then you don't have money to eat. Now, the relief package was said that it is going to go to those people who had often been depositing money on mobile money, and we can track mm -hmm. their history of receiving that money. And so again, you begin to wonder whose ideas are informing that policy. And so uh, we really need to be saying, mm, how come that this person thinks that this is so. And that is how you begin to hear people saying, well, the people in government are pretty much detached from the realities of our day-to-day -day life. And so the idea of cultural anthropology is to say that if you are going to be legislating or making policy for people, you need to understand their way of life. You need to understand their knowledge systems. You need to understand what their central logic is. So for example, it's very fascinating for me as a cultural mm. anthropologist that the speaker of parliament um, has shut down parliament specifically so that members of parliament can go back and investigate in yoga. And I wonder, those members of parliament are from where? All of this time when a yoga is being implemented in their constituencies, what were mm. they doing? Do we need exactly. a complete close down for parliament for them now to go like they are flying in from Europe or to their villages to investigate in yoga? What is their role? And you cannot tell me that every time you change leaders in parliament, there is no institutional memory because all those mm -hmm. constituencies had a representative in parliament. Why is it necessary to shut down government business in parliament and go to the field to appreciate what you should have already done because you are a member of parliament? Yes. No, so it also speaks to the fact that um, we, 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 we now we have institutionalized incompetence, for lack of a better way to say it, that we have decided that um, somehow the local government systems and structures cannot work and we do not trust them to provide the necessary information for these ideas to continue. And maybe then it could also cause us to question the bigger governance or political management system that we have adopted over the years, that must we run um, a, a system where some want to build actual working decentralized systems where the person who sits in Kampala does not have to go back to Napak all the time, but rather is part of a certain structure and information just runs through. And I guess that's why like cultural anthropology is very, very important. So I want to move us to the second uh, part of this segment. So we've talked about all of these things and you've argued that uh, understanding the way societies exist, both historically, uh, historically and also in the present today. And um, globally, there's a big conversation on decolonization. And so one of the one half of the conversation is saying, listen, we need to sit down and deeply think about the things that we know that we have learned over the years, like the example you gave about education, that whatever it is that we're implementing now is not even what the people who gave it to us are implementing. They legitimately moved on from this because they understand that their society is also transforming. But first we are here, stuck in this place. Uh, and now we, we, we don't even know how to move forward because I guess also there's a part of us that is waiting for them to send us another plan and then we continue from there, right? And then there's another set of people who are saying, listen, this colonialism thing came, it ended, right? We cannot somehow th think that we are going to go back to Nora saying, Amanite sort, and therefore this is our basket of knowledge from back in the day, and we're going to go back into it. And, and, and so we're going to implement our ideas from there. Like that's too behind, let's just go with the world the way it is already going. What are your thoughts on the conversation around decolonization and how does that 
um, converse, how does that conversation then translate into creating viable development options for the people of Uganda? It, it's very interesting that actually it has taken COVID-19 to present us with this type of thinking. And for me, I go back again to education. Very many mm. parents, um, leaders, all across from the opposition political parties to the mainstream NRM party, the leadership is wailing and saying, oh, the schools are closed. Our children have missed out for two years. Uh, they are not getting educated. And you're like, okay, listen to yourself. Have you ceded your own responsibility of educating your child? And when I think about myself, I had the privilege and the honor to spend a lot of time with my paternal grandmother. And mm. in my day-to-day -day life, the things that I learned from my paternal grandmother, who I am named after, by the way, mm -hmm. are the ones that come to play, how I cook, how I self-check myself when I dress. She had a certain way of getting you to say, well, what message are you trying to communicate with that dress? Uh, mm -hmm. how I carry myself uh, to a certain degree. And of course, it is important for us to have formal education in class. We are not an isolated community. We are part mm -hmm. of the global world. But can we find a balance in which our knowledge systems that we are, that we are pushed aside can be allowed to evolve? So for example, I will use land, because it is a hot topic right now in Uganda. Yes. In the constitution of Uganda, four systems of land tenure are recognized. Milo is recognized mostly because in the Buganda area, maybe Bantu area, there is that system of Milo. For the other parts in the Nilo hermetic areas of the country, um, mostly the Teso, Lango, Karamoja, um, Acholi, uh, possibly even in, in, in cultures in West Nile, the tenure is mm. called customary tenure. And then you have the ones that have been brought in, which are global westernized, which are freehold and then leasehold. And mm. even within our own uh, policies, customary tenure is given a... Is, is treated as though it was the offer and not given the full power as freehold and leasehold. And the people who are in Ministry of Lands have this tendency of treating customary tenure as though it was the, I don't know what to say, bastard child or that child who has no parents, it's an offer. And yet the majority of the land in a greater part of Uganda is actually mm -hmm. under customary tenure. And so you find a, a whole lot of machinations taking place with the support of even individuals from those communities that should be agitating for customary tenure to be retained and to be allowed to evolve under the leadership of the cultural heads of the different communities. Uh, they are busy fighting it, calling it backward, calling it silly, calling it not good for development, and then saying, oh, if customary tenure should be retained, it should behave exactly like leasehold tenure. And therefore, we mm -hmm. want now to start issuing certificates of customary tenure. A whole lot of bollocks and nonsense. Because customary tenure, the way it is practiced, for example, within the Itaso culture, is exactly mm -hmm. the same as the land tenure systems of China. The land tenure systems of China, for the bulk of it, are based on use rights, the right to use the land. And if you are not using the land, to allow others to use it. And therefore, it removes that horrible, horrible neoliberal um, uh, commercialization of land and for people to start speculating on land. Issuances mm -hmm. of certificates of customary tenure are just geared towards making it easier for people to buy that land, making it easier for those people who have no concern about the use mm -hmm. rights of other members of that land to sell it off. And then the other members of land are left uh, without any protection whatsoever. And so 
there is nowhere. You know how you have a registry for leasehold, you have a registry for freehold. The Ministry of Land mm -hmm. has not instituted the re registry for customary tenure. And then it keeps on saying, ah, it is difficult to deal with this. But there are very many different clans. What do you mean? Where is the registry exactly. for customary tenure? Why isn't why is the constitution being blatantly violated? Because the constitution is the highest law of the land. Why is it being blatantly violated? Why isn't there an Iteso land board? Why isn't there a Lango land board? Why isn't there an Acholi land board? Why is Buganda land board being uh, pushed aside on handling issues of Milo land? We need to be able to say, come on people, our constitution recognizes this. And until that constitution is amended and those clauses removed, we must implement it that way. But you find that the actual implementation in Ministry of Lands is in direct contradiction with the constitution because their way of thinking is that the global westernized land tenure systems are the better ones. And their basis of handling land tenure is based on formulae that have been developed from the outside. And those formulae, when they do not fit in within our customary tenure, we do not make effort to tell the other people to adjust theirs. We say, okay, let us bastard that, let us, uh, uh, let us erase ours, if your word is yes. English, let us erase mm -hmm. ours in order to accommodate the other one. And so those are the things that when people talk about decolonizing, we need to talk more about. Decolonization is not just about uh, the physical living of the other and giving mm -hmm. us space to govern ourselves. Decolonization means we need to start decolonizing our minds. And where do we start decolonizing our minds? we start to decolonize our minds within our education system. We need to reteach some of these things. We need to find out the history of the colonized and not the history of the colonized as is told by the victor. And right now, if you look at our textbooks, if you look at how, the way we think, there is an automatic belief of that what is of the global West can do no wrong. And yet, that is not also always the case, as we can see that even in our so-called biggest democracy in the United States of America, they are struggling with that kind of situation. Yes. Thank you so much, Nora. I really like the fact that you've used the example of land because land is like the most important thing for anyone in Uganda because uh, Uganda is largely an agrarian um, society mm -hmm. that even even when you move away from the discussion of being actively involved in agriculture, all of us are trying to acquire a piece of land somewhere, whether it's a 50 by 100 or 100 by 100. And when you talked about um, the, the, the user rights, I, I, I love that conversation because right now we have um, a conversation on land that is that is steeped in the idea of exploitation as opposed to communal usership. So you have a situation where you're willing to evict, evict 500 villages because someone wants to, because an individual company wants to plant sugarcane as opposed to centering the 500 villages in the planting of sugarcane. So ideally they should be, the, the, the community, the different clans should come together and agree that on this big piece of land that we own as a community, this is the area we're going to designate for that factory to be set up. And this is the kind of input we're going to have in the, in the existence of that kind of factory. And so that way, like if we thought about it honestly and, and put our minds to it, we would have actually more equally distributed development. The argument today is that um, uh, poor people are unable to use land and produce a necessary profit and that is because we we've, we've internalized uh capitalism neoliberal capitalism which also informed a lot um colonization because people needed land to feed their consumer behavior in the global north and so people grabbed land right left and center and so we have we've, we've taken that also into this debate so because we don't want to engage I, I was really surprised when you said that the Ministry of Land says that there are very many, the clans are too many. Yeah. And in my I'm thinking, they are they already organized. It's actually the easier option as opposed to- They are to listed in the constitution of Uganda. 
Exactly. It's easier than chasing a one Maria, than chasing a one Nora somewhere because you're trying to sort this land matter out. But I love that you've used that example. And maybe someday we'll also just have like a broader conversation on land specifically and what the current political events mean for the ownership of land. Uh, which is a, a discussion for another day. So I wanted to bring you back to the um, to the issue of of, of 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 development and moving forward for us as a country. Many people have argued over the years that. Um, Okay, let me use this example. It took people dying of COVID for us to appreciate that indigenous medicine was actually a thing, right? Uh, when Dr. Wang came up with the COVID deaths in the beginning, we were all stuck on all the white medicine, for lack of a better way to address it, uh, without realizing that, well, all of it really comes from the things that we are continuously ignoring and rejecting. And so when a few when COVID deaths became the um, the exciting thing for, for the treatment of COVID, and there were very many testimonies, then the National Drug Authority ran really quickly to solve the problem. And of course, there were other political conversations around it, which we won't get into because that's really not part of our business. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to find out how then in practical ways, and you can use whatever example it is. I think one for me, one of the most exciting things about your lived example of your cultural anthropolog anthropological practice is how you're using it in terms of issues of food security and food sovereignty, uh, of which sovereignty is the bigger and more important conversation we should actually be having. Um, how can we then apply the learnings, the practices, the knowledge from cultural anthropology into our everyday development practices that people say, oh, experts, we say one, two, three things, or people in this practice, we say one, two, three things. But when we are saying we, it, it cannot become practical. So how do we apply the knowledge, practice, principles of cultural anthropology into our everyday development questions? It is very interesting because whereas um, COVID-19 is an airborne disease and it is highly infectious. In many ways, the body's ability to fight off or to survive COVID-19 goes back to nutrition. What mm. is it you have been eating and what is lacking from your body? I had, I do not have any uh, empirical data on this, but I heard uh, that if you have a, a sufficient volumes of vitamin D, you stand a better chance of fighting this. Um, Dr. Kiza Vestige has come out and has been giving a whole listing. I've never tried any of his concoctions, but uh, they are based, if you look at the things that Dr. Mm. Kiza Vestige bases his concoctions on, they are things that we take for granted and that grow nicely and freely here in our gift of nature, Uganda's lands. Mm. So then for me to connect to the idea of development, I move on and I start to think about how Operation Wealth Creation is causing an ethnocide of our local species and our local varieties of mango and of oranges. Recently, I was hearing that our local mango is not considered good for those mm -hmm. factories that are being set up because it has all of those threats. But in terms yeah. of quality of that mango and its ability to survive um, in the without having to use pesticides or fertilizer, which is inorganic, is high. And so we are allowing a regime that is getting rid of our own nice mangoes and is bringing in these mangoes, which require for you to use artificial fertilizers and artificial um, um, artificial things to make it grow. Mm -hmm. And if you do not use it, use those things, then it doesn't grow to its specification. But also those foreign crops, when they come in, they may come in with other pests and diseases that we did not think about that will cause trouble in the land. So for example, I heard that there was a specific cassava that was introduced in Tesla, uh, which is not very good for consuming atab. And then you're like, okay, if we cannot eat this cassava as atab, why has it yeah. been being brought here? And uh, yeah. apparently it was brought there so that we start doing starch. I mean, so are you more concerned in making money out of starch or are you more concerned about the nutrition of people? And so the decisions that we are making about what kinds of food we are promoting and growing um, is a very important 
thing to unravel. I shudder when I hear uh, that, uh, what's it called? Rolex has a national day. And Atap does it. Yeah. Rolex is made out of imported stuff. It's made up of imported wheat. It is made out mm -hmm. of imported oil. Okay, now we have our oil here, which was mm -hmm. established from what you have just described, families getting thrown off the land and a palm plantation put there. And what is the value for money we are getting? What is the nutrition value in um, Rolex compared to ATAP? And mm -hmm. Rolex has a national day, ATAP does not. Um, Matoke does not have a national day. And matoke is the, is the staple food of the first, the largest nation of Uganda, Buganda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you begin to ask yourself, how is it that zebu are not the animals that we promote, but instead mm -hmm. you hear that the ministry is importing a certain kind of big bull or, or importing semen or importing, I do not know what, from somewhere else. But then you hear that the Karamojong cattle is not getting uh, the necessary uh, veterinarians to go and help it to make sure that that whole system, that whole cattle economy is, mm. uh, is productive for Uganda. But instead, the zebu animal is wanted to be almost ethnocide. The Ankole, Ankole cattle, um, they are there. They are a very specific, unique species but if you ask our ministry who holds the necessary seed for those animals, where is the seed bank for all of our indigenous crops, for all of our indigenous animals, who holds the seed bank for those things? We hear that crops are disappearing. Not only are they disappearing in the field, but they are disappearing from our plates. And so you find that in many families now, the tradition is posho and beans. And yet for me, when I was growing up, posho and beans was food that was given to prisoners and uh, you to posho and beans on your plate at home was like a high level of, a high sign of poverty. But how is it that our government thinks that when it is time to do food relief aid, they do posho and beans? So those are the kinds of conversations that cultural anthropologists begins to see because when you define food security, the definition of food security also says culturally acceptable. So there are certain foods people will eat just so that they can have something in the stomach, but which bring mm -hmm. them shame when they are eating them. It is a shame for certain families in Tesla that they are not able to feed themselves with their staple food, atta. And most of the time they are not able to feed themselves because of the so-called modernization policies. When sorghum in Teso was changed from being a food crop to producing the sorghum that would make bottled beer, there was a whole lot of damage made there. And so mm -hmm. when millet has been turned away from being a food crop to being the one which produces ajon, because ajon here in Uganda, they call it malwa, but ajon from millet is extremely popular. And so mm. the, the, the changing of uses of food because of modernization culture. And so for example, now it used to be the pride of a man from Teso, a Tesot man, or even a woman from Teso, a Tesot, to host visitors at their home, to consume, even if it be millet beer, consume a tap and wherever. But the culture is changing where now you have these urban slums mm -hmm. in the villages. And I call them, uh, slamitization of our villages. So you take what used to be in the urban slum and you put it in the villages. Those trading centers, they are everywhere. And those trading centers are characteristically the same throughout Uganda. Uh, you will find now that people have, go to drink at the trading center and not at home. You find that men or especially men might leave the family at home without food, but will go and buy food at a trading center and will eat. And so the, the pride of I am a man with a home and I have responsibility to feed my family and to sit down and eat with my family is changing because it is believed that the modern way to do it is to eat in a hotel. And yet when I was growing up, my late grandfather would say, I cannot eat in a hotel like a mukop. And now it is the other way around. Eating in the hotel mm. is 
is, is what is considered bourgeoisie and very high class for the Marias. And yet <laughs> in my grandfather's time, it was Bakopi, people who are not mm. able to have a significant ho a home and have other ones who eat in hotels. And so my grandfather, for him, he would not eat in a hotel. It doesn't matter whether he was on safari or not. If he was on safari, he would eat food that has been packed for him to eat until he gets to his next destination. Or he would go and eat in another chief's home. So he would begin his journey knowing that I will stop at the other chief's home and that is where I will break my journey and I will eat. And then the other chief will be aware that my fellow chief is coming to visit and will expect them. And I do believe this is how we ordinary people also used to do it. But now someone starts their journey saying, hmm, I have to have my money for buying gonja by the roadside because they cannot even branch off to their relative's place or a friend's place to break the journey, to refresh, and then move on forward. Because that yes, is not that. Yes. Sorry, thank you very much, Nora. I like that um, you're actually highlighting very key issues in the way um, the adopting of a lot of um, practices from the global north has uh, violently, in both subtle and open ways, changed the way we relate as people here. Uh, when you use the example of the food security and the changing in the in the food structures and systems and the disappearance, you called it ethnocide of, of different foods in 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 Uganda, I thought about the example of South America and what um, a company called Monsanto has been doing in those countries. So it's also, and it speaks really back to the discussion of neoliberal capitalism and, and the idea of profit. So Monsanto makes the seed, Monsanto makes the pesticide, uh, and, and then so they control the entire food production system. So if you get a seed, if they feel like people are not cooperating, they have the power to create the pest that is going to all the disease that can actually kill the plant, then you have to buy the pesticide. So the money stays within a certain circle. And because for many of these, you cannot replant without actually going back to the producers to actually buy them. And yet for us, we had a practice where for every harvest, you kept a, a collection of seeds that were going to be used for the next planting, which has completely disappeared. So today we have situations where people don't have food and not because um, of climate change things, because climate change has also contributed to that, but also because if you've not, if the price has gone low and you're unable to make money between uh, having food and having money to buy seed again, people are constantly having that to negotiate that on a daily basis. But also the fact that you, you we, we've, we're choosing convenience over sustainability. So because the, the factory says that our mango has too much fiber for it to be able to be produced into juice, we decide to wipe this mango out and bring a mango that is convenient for the factory as opposed to what's convenient for the people. And then we've also seen that these factories are not making the necessary profit to keep people sustained on top of the fact that Again, it's not anybody growing the seed, that the, the kind of food that they're talking about. They're choosing specific people with big chunks of land to be able to do that, which takes us back to the conversation of eviction of people, um, land tenure systems and all of that. So how all of these things are actually linked and how we casually do not think about cultural anthropology, mm -hmm. that when we're thinking about people's behavior, people's behavior, we only think about it in terms of the way we dress, the way we talk, uh, and new technologies without thinking about uh, the, the, the things that hold people together, like things like nutrition as, as a discussion altogether, or even how families relate over time. I feel guilty for the, when you highlighted the issue of people passing by their relatives to go and buy food somewhere. And my dad, I'm like, oh my God, how often do I, <laughs> how often do I go <laughs> to my people? Like I'm capable of traveling to my home village and, live, and sleeping in a hotel for an entire week. So yes, yes I, feel, I feel really, really attacked. And so now, um, as we conclude this conversation, because it has been really enriching and enlightening, and I think we need to have more of these conversations, but also tailored to specific areas. What would be your recommendations on how it is that we can move the conversation of our cultural anthropologies, the learning of how societies exist and evolve to be centered in policy making, in um, development idea realization? That's what I called it, the process of 
coming up with ideas of when we're thinking about our existence as a country, not just Uganda, but even because the problems we have in Uganda are not unique to Uganda. They are actually the kind of problems that you see manifesting in every country created through the colonial process. So how then do we center um, all this indigenous knowledge in pushing the development agenda forward? Well, it's, it's, it's really a very, very big challenge, but um, I believe in small is beautiful. I think that mm -hmm. each one of us, as you have just done right here on air, on screen, you have admitted that you are one of those possibly high powered executives who can go into your home area and stay in a hotel for a whole week, paying the hotel for accommodation, for food, for everything. And you do not consider that you can actually go and spend time as you do your work, say with your aunt who is living in the same vicinity. Very often it is not possible for you to do that because the accommodation in which your aunt lives is not suitable. So mm. how do we begin that internal reflection for us as individuals, us who have so-called made it, us the current educated, us who are colluding or accepting to allow for the ethnocide of our cultures. I would say that uh, an intervention that makes us proud of our languages would be great. Uh, the Baganda, to a great degree, love their language, but not all of the young Baganda now are confident with the Luganda language. And if you do that, it cuts across all languages of Uganda. How many people confidently are able to read and write their own language to start with? How many people are confidently able to understand, even if they are not able to read and write? Because there are very many people who understand English, but they do not know how to read and write English, but they at least mm -hmm. understand English. How many people actually understand the underpinning behind those concepts? So many times people say that development has failed, but from a neoliberal perspective, development mm -hmm. has not failed. Development as it was designed, was designed to keep us where we are at now in order to mm -hmm. do what you just said, to supply the needs of the person who designed this development paradigm. Development was not designed for you to become uh, empowered so that you stop producing the raw uh, products that are sent there to be converted. Development was not designed for you to stop producing raw coffee that is taken and then sold back to you as branded made in, 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 in uh, European countries. Development was not made. I mean, it is a joke that some of those countries where tea does not grow have their own tea brands and yet we are exporting the tea to them. And mm -hmm. so, we need to begin first to go back to controlling the language. Language is extremely important because language is the system through which knowledge is transferred. Now, if I am not able to articulate the language to my niece, because my niece does speak a language that I speak, or my grandchild, because my grandchild does not speak a language that I speak, I do not know how many times I have watched with pain as grandchildren are taken to see their grandparents and they, they just look at each other. And they, they smile after they greeting. They smile. The child even accepts, the child might say that thing, that woman there is that I don't want to go there where they, yeah. and the mother says, it is okay. The younger mm -hmm. generation, your generation, who now even blatantly tell you that I cannot leave my child with my, my child. And yet wow. it is the mother who raised you. It happens. So when it is holiday time, when I was growing up, when I was in primary school, and that is how I have a comfortable balance of both cultures, holiday time for me was time to go and be with my grandmother without the supervision of my parents. And it was brilliant. We played, mm -hmm. we collected firewood, we played in the swamps, we did what, we did what. And then our parents would come back for us maybe a week or so when it is time to go back to school, to prepare now to go back to school. And when you are mm -hmm. at school, you followed the school systems, waiting until such a time to go back. And so many times people could not tell us apart. My father's children, my father's brother's children, we were all children and we would play in edge sets. So you could tell us mm -hmm. apart 
by age sets, but not by whose child is this one, who is this one. That mm. was not highlighted because we were all enjoying that. And so that whole process of us being ashamed of our own cultures needs to be worked on. We cannot move forward until we can decolonize our minds. And so we need to look at those things that can help us to decolonize our mind. Speaking our own languages, elevating our own languages to a standard where they can be used. So for example, I see no reason whatsoever that the district local governments do not conduct business in their own languages that are predominantly spoken there, but are then required to have translation to the official language. I see no reason why not. But then you find people struggling with English that they do not understand yes. to do official work. And so very often, you have seen these things on social media. They has written, uh, which is completely meaningless or provides a comedy. And that is their mm. official <laughs> instrument. That is, yeah. you understand. So mm. why isn't that person allowed to write their letter? in whatever language they are able to do. And then that letter is translated. And it is, it is fascinating that we are okay with the French speaking French, the German speaking German, and then we struggle to get translation of what the German has said, but you cannot speak to the German in Acheson and get somebody to translate to the German what you are saying. It is not normal. And then because yeah. our schools used to beat us for speaking vernacular. And then you like, if, if you are in a gathering and you start speaking with somebody you know who speaks your language, they say, are you backbiting us? What is that? So those are the kinds of things we need to start thinking about. Until we begin to accept to speak in our own languages, our culture mm -hmm. will get lost because the culture is maintained through the languages. The code is in the language. If I cannot understand what is the translation for development in your language, it often doesn't mean the same thing mm -hmm. it is made up it is yes. made up and then mm -hmm. when we, you come and you hear honestly i like to use christianity or maybe even islam religion if you hear mm -hmm. some of those people who are so-called teachers of religion they are often getting it wrong because they actually don't understand the language in which the religion they are teaching is coded so for example when the president of rwanda uh, Paul Kagame said, I will not accept you to be, is it a reverend or a preacher or whatever, unless you've mm. gone through the school of theology. And people were like, oh, but actually it makes sense. How can you mm -hmm. teach that what you don't understand? Because if you teach that what you don't understand, then you are making the wrong thing. Yes. I will give you a live example because currently, uh, as the managing director of SIPA, I am mentoring um, a team of young adults in northern Uganda. We are mentoring them to try to turn them into innovators against poverty in their communities. And we are now at the level where we are, we are teaching them financial management. And the kind of financial management we do is the kind that is perpetually practical for you to be able to make sense of it. And so mm -hmm. I am so alive in my mind now with concepts to do with financial management. And I see on uh, social media, somebody says financial advice for COVID period. And then they say assets are good, but having cash is better. But cash is an asset. And so yeah. you understand, eh? and, and so you begin to see that this person doesn't really know what they are talking about. Cash is yeah. a form of asset. Bank account is a form of asset. And now when you have online payments, mobile money, people can use their cards. Uh, you understand having your money in the bank is no longer a problem because you can just use your mobile money account or you can use your cash uh, card. Yeah, your card. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yet this person is trying to imply that it is better for you to have the cash on the ready like that couple where the termites ate the cash. And so you, oh, you, so say, sad. you know, what kind of advice is this person giving? And it's on social media. And you know that on social media, you can promote this thing and it reaches thousands. And thousands will begin to believe that because they don't understand English. And this person sounds very clever, sounds wise. 
and it is there, but these people are reading this thing and they are not understanding it. And these are the people who are now going in and saying, it is you who has not prayed correctly, that's why you remain in poverty. But if you had prayed correctly, you would not be in poverty. And yet the whole sermon is a whole lot of nonsense in my context here. Yes. No, that's that's really beautiful because, um, and I, I like that you we we we've consistently talked about the idea of context because I think a lot of times we just go read a book written by Donald Trump and then come and start giving a financial advice class on this other side without realizing the reality, the context in which Donald Trump is doing whatever it is that he's doing because I look at him more as a business person than anything else does not apply, but also in, in terms of what is it that we want to create a better world, I think we also don't question things enough in terms of how does this idea create a sustainable and responsible way of existing? Because these are people who are poster children of neoliberal capitalism that specializes in, in, in erasure, in exploitation, and focuses only on profit and not people. So from your, uh, from your last part of the discussion, the things that I've picked out is how do we rethink the way we use language and apply language to our development work? How are we even thinking about development? Because what is our idea of development? lights and all these fancy things or is it actually centering people and the existence of people in whatever approach it is that we're using but also the concept of rebuilding community that more often because again we've picked a lifestyle we've copied and pasted a lifestyle from somewhere else we are quickly progressing into very individualistic communities and we at some point we thought that maybe COVID might have woken us up but um, as soon as Uganda opens, we are back to normal, <laughs> to where we came from. And you really see there is no approach and there's no change moving forward. But there was also a very important point that you had made earlier, the concept of rethinking education. What are we learning? Uh, yesterday I was looking at the um, bill from the East African community where they are going to address issues of sexual reproductive health rights. And one of the issues they're talking about in terms of children, um, girls, students who have gotten pregnant and returning to school is that they talked about returning school education. Then, they, then there's a specific clause on uh, they should also provide options for vocational education, skilling. And for me, the idea that these two things have, are, are being separated tells us how it is that we think about education. Absolutely. How is it that that, that skilling and vocational learning is not part of the mainstream education. It's the mainstream. Idea. It should be the yes, mainstream. Yes. Yeah. So, so separating it and thinking that, oh, okay, if you fail to go to school, there's this alternative, right, that you can actually, and yet there are a lot of things that we need to exist in the world. We learn through existing with people, which doesn't actually happen in the formal education system. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to take this opportunity, Nora, to thank you very much for making time, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. Like you said, you're a continuous learner, and I think that's what we must aspire for as individuals, that at no point should we think we are experts and know everything. So thank you so much for sharing your time and your knowledge with us, and thank you to our audience for tuning in, for listening. Uh, we'll see you again on the Women's Talk Show on the Civic Space TV. Please follow our, our platforms on Facebook, on Twitter. It's all Civic Space TV on the different platforms. And encourage your friends to subscribe. There's a subscribe button somewhere at the bottom of this video. Please subscribe so that you always get notifications at the point at which um, a video is uploaded so that you do not miss any content. Thank you, Nora. And I wish you a very, very beautiful week. Bye-bye.